Join us for a day at the office with an infantryman. Meet the high-tech foot soldier of today and the 21st century, next on Foot Soldier. I got 20 minutes till the next chopper. I was ready to, man. I was there. Well, I'll tell you what. Today, the term foot soldier isn't a very accurate way to describe modern warriors. These days, infantrymen don't do much walking or marching into battle. They are flown into combat, board transport helicopters, or driven in by armored fighting vehicles. Some jump out of airplanes, or in the case of the United States Marine Corps, attack from amphibious assault craft. But no matter how they get to the battlefield, once they are there, all infantry troops have the same basic mission. Close with and destroy the enemy. For centuries, the order to close with and destroy the enemy meant a nasty face-to-face -face fist fight with the bad guys. The first weapons were probably big rocks, but out of necessity, warriors had to develop better weapons. Rocks became bows and arrows, and swords and spears. All that close range hacking and stabbing made for a pretty nasty fight. Up close and personal was the only way for a foot soldier to get his job done. There was no way around it. There wasn't much finesse, just get in there and whack them. The advent of firearms work of the foot soldier changed significantly. Firearms meant that the foot soldier could shoot at his enemy without exposing himself to danger. He could hide in a safe place, and as long as he could see his foe, he had a good chance of hitting him. Of course, the other guys had guns too, and they could shoot back. As muskets became machine guns, foot soldier faced a very deadly arsenal. To survive all that hot lead and shrapnel flying through the air, the foot soldier learned new ways to fight. He developed tactics. He perfected things like fields of fire and flanking maneuvers. Instead of fighting harder, he fought smarter. Foot soldiers learned how to use the element of surprise to their advantage they figured out new ways to strike the enemy. One of the most devastating and shocking is dropping in unexpectedly, a technique perfected by my mother-in-law. And with the advent of armored vehicles, foot soldiers are able to get to battle a lot faster, so there isn't much foot left in foot soldier. On today's deadly battlefields, new technology gives the foot soldier a fighting chance. That technology has reached the point where a foot soldier doesn't even have to see his enemy with his own eyes. Night vision goggles and thermal sensors can do that for him. Over the centuries, their uniforms have changed. Their tactics are more effective. Their gear has improved by leaps and bounds. Pull back! However, tomorrow's modern warriors still have a lot in common with their forefathers. They are still expected to do whatever is necessary to grab enemy real estate. Tomorrow's foot soldier, no matter how high-tech his equipment may become, will still have to endure many of the same nasty things that his ancestors had to overcome. Rain or shine, wet or dry, Across meadows, mountains, or oceans, the infantryman is expected to carry out his orders, no questions asked. Let's go. Except perhaps, how did I get myself into this? The foot soldier is expected to be resourceful. 
He has to be prepared for anything, so he has to carry everything. His helmet and flak vest protect him from whatever the enemy might throw at him. An assault rifle, grenades, and a bayonet are his primary weapons. Food and other supplies fill his backpack. With all this trudging around, you can see why his most treasured possession is a good pair of boots. Every pound they carry and every item they wear is meant to ensure their supremacy and survival on the battlefield. There is no such thing as overpacking when your life is at stake. Foot soldiers like to call themselves grunts. No one is certain where the nickname came from, but most will say it speaks to the miserable life of the foot soldier. They rarely get enough rest. They are usually bearing some heavy burden. Understandably, the foot soldier grunts a lot. He grunts when he walks. He grunts when he sits down. He's not a barbarian, though some have suggested he's not a too distant relative. Although many women serve in the military in all sorts of jobs, the infantry, the home of the foot soldier, remains limited to men. What could possibly attract young men to the most dangerous of military careers? Risks are high, the hours are long, the food isn't great, and with a private's basic pay at about 210 bucks a week, it can't be the money. You will always have people who will voluntarily put themselves in harm's way. As long as we have brave people, and these are brave people, some of them are a little crazy, but most of them are just brave. They're willing to make that ultimate sacrifice. There are two places you can go to join the ranks of the infantry, the US Army and the US Marine Corps. The making of an infantryman begins long before they fire a shot on the battlefield. It starts on their first day of basic training, or boot camp. The United States Marine Corps Recruiting Depot in San Diego, there is no mistaking when civilian life ends and boot camp begins. You're now both the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California, and we're seeing birds at Building 622. From now on, the last word out of your mouth is sir. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir. I said the last word out of your mouth is sir. So you're going to say either yes, sir, or no, sir. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Get off the bus. The transition takes about three seconds, and the message is loud and clear. Emphasis on the loud. There are two ways of doing things, the wrong way and the Marine Corps way. And it's up to the recruit to figure out which is which. When in doubt, they get plenty of helpful advice. When I tell you to do something, you better do it at mock speed, as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> That's how recruits start their day. There is no snooze button in this alarm clock. Now, if this doesn't bring out the killer instinct, nothing will. Hurry it up! A team of three drill instructors assigned to a company of about 60 new recruits has just 13 weeks to teach what it takes to succeed and survive on the battlefield. It is the drill instructor's responsibility to ensure that every recruit becomes a dependable and deadly marksman. Take it like you mean it. It's your weapon. Recruits are young, between the ages of 18 and 26. Most of them are physically ready for the challenge, but none of them knows exactly what to expect. Nothing is like the way it was back home. It seems that someone is always unhappy with what you're doing. Everything that the drill instructors do is done for a purpose. And little by little, they explain these things, and it starts dawning on you. And that purpose is to get us, if ever we have to go to combat, get us out of combat alive. As you would expect, the program starts with PT, or physical training. PT builds the recruit's stamina for the incredible demands of combat. Dawn to dusk, it's nonstop huffing and puffing. Are we motivated? 
baby. Yes, sir! Marine Corps wings are made of gold. I don't know, but it's been said. Although this may sound like choir practice, it has nothing to do with improving their voices. The songs, called Jody's, keep them motivated. When they're marching or running, they help keep them in step. We're going to run all day till the run is done. Going to run all day till the run is done. On the dreaded confidence course, recruits push with everything they have and confront their fears head on. It used to be called the obstacle course, but calling it confidence course makes it sound like it's good for you. All along, the drill instructors downplay the individual and stress the importance of the team. Only by working together will the new recruits find the strength to complete the demanding tasks. If one man fails, the whole platoon fails. It kind of makes the rest of the platoon watch that person and keep him in, in line so it doesn't happen again. If one person messes up in the, in the field, that's like, he might kill the rest of the platoon. So you have to keep everybody in line. The recruits are taught that being able to count on the man next to you and knowing you can trust him with anything may mean the difference between life and death. It's not to embarrass that one particular recruit or to put him on the spot, but it's just to let him know, basically, like, we're all one team. So if one recruit messes up, then we, we all pay for it. Now, in the same token, when a recruit does good, you use him as an example. Hey, this is what we need to do. If one recruit can comprehend it and get the job done correctly, then everybody else should be able to. Don't look down range either. Just close your eyes, relax. On the firing line, the recruits learn their most valuable war fighting skill, how to shoot straight. Every recruit, before he can call himself a Marine, must demonstrate proficiency with the M16. If you can't hit a target, the Marines can't use you, except maybe to flip hamburgers at the officer's club picnic. Simulated combat gives the recruits a chance to apply some of what they have been learning. War games reveal how well they perform in a very stressful situation. Most soldiers fight not for abstract ideals or for democracy or socialism or whatever. Uh, they fight not to disgrace themselves among their immediate group because that immediate group is their battlefield family, which to a large extent, you know, enhances their ability to survive. You miss the familiar surrounding. But they don't learn out in the field, they learn in classrooms. The recruits study Marine Corps history military procedures, chain of command, and improve their mind along with their body. Hey, here's, a, here's a career letter from the Navy. They want you to join the Navy. But boot camp isn't all just work. Mail call is one of those rare times that the recruits can pause and relax and enjoy a moment of peace and quiet. It gives them a chance to let their hair down. Well, what's left of it. And we're carrying these weapons like we're going duck hunting. And we're not, this is not hunting season. You see that red dotted line there, son? Yes, sir. Well, put your darn right foot on it. Finally, after 88 grueling days of getting up early, getting yelled at a lot, running, marching, and marksmanship training, the recruits proved they have what it takes, have earned the title of Marine. After all the hardships, maybe it's just being able to say, I made it, that makes it all worthwhile. After graduation from boot camp, the new Marines head to different schools and training centers to learn their chosen career field. For those who can't get enough of the great outdoors, off to infantry school.
the Infantry School of Camp Pendleton, California, Marines spend weeks developing their combat skills. It's not a place for the faint of heart. Under the watchful eyes of seasoned veterans, they will learn how to use the firepower and tactics that will, in their own words, put the hurt on the bad guy. Hurrah! Let's move out. A Marine infantryman has quite a grab bag of weapons to choose from, each designed for a specific purpose, like the right tool for the right job. Their basic weapon is the Colt M16A2 assault rifle. It's made out of aluminum and plastic. It feels much like a toy. One squeeze of the trigger, and it's clear this is no pop gun. The M16 can fire one bullet with every squeeze of the trigger. Or, with a flick of a switch, it can fire a burst of three rounds with each trigger pull. Not too long ago, the M16 had a switch that allowed the rifleman to shoot continuously as long as he held back the trigger. He could keep firing until he ran out of ammunition, but this fully automatic feature was eliminated as it wasted too much ammo. The Marine Corps prefers its riflemen to exercise fire discipline, to choose targets within range, and to aim carefully. For greater firepower, the Marine reaches for the SOB. It stands for Squad Automatic Weapon, but they like to call it the SOB because it can cut down anything in its way. The SOB fires the same cartridge as the M16, but at a much higher rate, nearly 10 a second. It's the perfect weapon when the Marines need a little more firepower to convince the enemy to stay in their foxhole. More sustained, more potent, firepower pours from the M60 machine gun. It fires a bigger bullet than the M16 or the SOM. The Marines use a technique where two gun crews set up two M60s and alternate firing at the same target. One shoots for a few seconds, then stops. And the other guy shoots for a bit, and he stops. Then back to the first. A short rest keeps the gun from overheating. They call it talking guns. Now, that's a conversation I don't want any part of. When all else fails, the Marines bring out the big guns, the granddaddy of them all, the M250 caliber machine gun. It's been in the military since the 1920s. Nothing can beat it for reliability and for reaching out and touching someone. Weapons training teaches the foot soldier more than how to shoot the weapon. It gives them confidence that these things will work as advertised. They call it validation. The troops will quickly find out if they work or not. If they don't work, they will use something else. They will improvise. Uh, you can't fool the troops, because what are you going to do? Shoot them? They're already at risk of that. They have nothing to lose. And you often, if you, and as, as ordnance officers, you know, people who develop these weapons have discovered when they go out to talk to the troops, they get some very sassy answers. Because here's a fellow who finally meets the guy who gave him this piece of crap, which almost got him killed, and he's asking me questions. Well, you get some very colorful answers. Once the foot soldiers know they can trust their weapons and have learned how to shoot them, they are taught how to use them in combat, something called tactics. Tactics is nothing more than getting the right weapon at the right place at the right time. You can never send a Marine where you can send a bullet. And the bigger the bullet, the better it is. That's the philosophy that we try to get across to our unit leaders, is proper use of supporting arms. If that's the case, I wouldn't go in there until I had a bullet the size of a Buick. The basic fighting unit of the Marine Corps is the fire team. Three men with M16 rifles. They maneuver together and protect each other. Two fire teams form a squad. Each squad has a leader and an eighth man armed with the saw. Three squads make up a platoon, usually under the command of an officer, a lieutenant. 
principle we're getting through to the Marines on the squad level here today is to work as a team, to cover each other as they move, uh, fire discipline, fire control, also movement and movement control. When one team is up or one individual is up and moving, there should always be a three to one ratio of people putting fire down onto the objective in order to suppress the enemy so that that Marine, when he's moving, he knows that his buddies are shooting in support of his movement. These Marines are firing live ammunition, not blanks. And a mistake could be fatal. In this business, fatal is a word you want to avoid. Nobody is actually shooting back at them, but the live ammunition adds a realistic element to the training exercise. The goal for these two squads is to reach the top of the hill and break through the enemy's front line. By doing that, you're getting inside the enemy, you're in, in behind the enemy's actual forward lines, you're expanding the breach each time you move through it, and you get into the enemy's control, command, the logistical area, and what you do is you put a real hurt on the bad guys that way, because now they're cut off from their command. They can't, they can't function. After the attack, they return to the instructor for an explanation of what they did right and wrong. Adapted and you overcame your situation. You kept a good wall of firepower going down range. You were motivated. You got into position. You provided cover fire for the devil dogs having to rush. You did your job. That sound, by the way, is how Marines express pleasure. Maybe that's why they're called grunts. Now that these foot soldiers know how to fight, it's time to get them to the fight. Here is where they take the foot out of foot soldier. Like most of us, Marine infantrymen commute to work. On occasion, they might even take an Amtrak. But not the, honey, let's meet in the dining car for lunch Amtrak. Marines ride the Sarge, I'm about to lose my lunch Amtrak. In this case, Amtrak is short for Amphibious Tracked Vehicle. At some point in his career, a Marine infantryman will climb inside an Amtrak's dark, wet compartment to practice what Marines do best, storming the beach. These beasts are cramped, loud, and between the diesel fumes and your fellow Marines, they really smell bad. They are about as relaxing as the spinning teacup ride at the amusement park. But none of these guys complains too much when the alternative may involve something like the backstroke or freestyle medley. The Amtrak is propelled through the waves by two water jets that pump out 14,000 gallons a minute. Aft-mounted deflectors, controlled by the driver, vector the water jets for steering, stopping, and reversing. Imagine what the Vikings could have done with water jets and thrust deflectors. The Amtraks move fast enough that any defenders can be quickly overwhelmed by the sudden arrival of hundreds of screaming Marines. They made it through the pounding surf and stormed the beachhead, all without getting their feet wet. Dayland! Once again, they are back to being foot soldiers. Let's go, let's go. But not for long. These eight-wheeled armored cars, called LAVs, turn foot soldiers into road warriors. On a hard surface road, It'll run uh, 60, 70 miles an hour. It'll just zip right along. It's easy to handle. Power steering, power brakes. It's just like driving a car. You jump in there and driving. It's got a steering wheel. It's got an accelerator. It's got a foot brake. It's uh, you got a shifter on the on the uh, left side of the driver. It's just like driving a car. It's, it's a matter of fact, it's probably even easier. <laughs> it's a lot more fun. <laughs> 
it could be the ultimate sport utility vehicle. Of course, the color options are limited, green. A crew of three operates the seven-ton vehicle, a driver, a gunner, and a commander. When they are out on maneuvers, these guys don't just drive the LAV, they live in it. It becomes a very well-defended motorhome. Working and living practically on top of each other like this, you would think these guys would get on each other's nerves. But this closeness develops the teamwork that's so important for success in the field. Working together. That's all it takes, is working together, time and time, over and over again, repetitiveness. You keep going over the same thing again and again, and eventually you'll work into that groove. And this living together and coming to the field and working together, that's what builds it. Sure, it must be great to have your own set of wheels to get to combat, but since these guys don't march anywhere, they don't have a chance to sing any Jodies, those nifty marching songs. So we offer them this. Living in an LAV, not much room for you or me. When you gotta live so close, wear a clothes fit on your nose. Sweating hard all day and night, always ready for the fight. Close the hatch and lock the door, push the pedal to the floor. Like the Marine Corps, the U.S. Army has its own unique way of moving foot soldiers. To help the Army's infantry keep up with its new fast-moving Abrams main battle tank, the Army developed the Bradley M2 infantry fighting vehicle. Tracks give the Bradley mobility. Heavy armor gives it survivability. And a 25-millimeter cannon and anti-tank missile launcher always give it the right of way. Bradley can fight its way into combat and drop eight army infantrymen right into the enemy's lap. On the battlefield, tanks and Bradleys work together as a mechanized force. The infantry protects the tanks from enemy attackers and the tanks protect the infantry with direct fire support. Mobility is the key to victory on the modern battlefield. Mechanized infantry came of age during the 100 hours of the 1991 Gulf War. Long columns of vehicles, every form of tracked and wheeled war machine, crossed the vast desert from Saudi Arabia to Kuwait and Iraq. With vehicles stretching to the horizon, Marine Corps and Army infantry covered unprecedented distances. Not one soldier walked to the battlefield. For the first time, they all got a ride. But wheels and tracks aren't the only ways of getting the foot soldier into combat. Today's modern warrior can take to the skies. Of all the ways to get the foot soldiers into combat, this has got to be the most spectacular. A mass jump of the Army's airborne infantry. These guys have got a fighting spirit that can't be beat. But you got to wonder, why would anyone jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Now, these won't tangle, will they? All right, airborne, to turn your direction to drift, and boy, get Roger Smith into the opposite direction to drift. Keep your feet and knees together. Keep your feet and knees together. Your head and eyes are on the horizon. You're looking good, airborne. You're looking good. Ain't that a bitch? I think I might have another word for it, like hallelujah, as in, thank God I'm still alive. Each year, about 14,000 would-be paratroopers start a grueling three-week training program at the U.S. Army Jump School at Fort Benning, Georgia. This place, by the way, is also where they invented humidity. These guys are probably gonna be upset that they are even in this show. You see, paratroopers don't like to think of themselves as foot soldiers. To them, a foot soldier is a dirty word. These guys are airborne warriors. 
because they wear a pair of wings on their chest. They call anyone who doesn't wear wings a leg. Being airborne is a honor, and it's not a right. You have to earn it. And if you can't earn it, then you don't need to be here. There's a thousand legs out there in the world, but there's only very few paratroopers. The United States Army Airborne School is probably one of the best schools the Army has to offer. It's a very demanding challenge to pass this course. We're off the wall, we're ready to go. We're off the wall, we're ready to go. We're standing tall, we're looking good. We're standing tall, we're looking good. We ought to be in Hollywood. We ought to be in Hollywood. I dress it right and cover down. We dress it right and cover down. I make it 40 all around. I make it 40 all around. The training we give them here is not for their mind, it's for their body, because when you jump out of an aircraft, your mind isn't in control of you, your body is. Of course, your mind isn't in control when you jump out of an airplane. If your mind was in control when you were jumping out of an airplane, you wouldn't be jumping out of an airplane in the first place. The training is so hard, nearly 2,000 candidates, almost 15%, will drop out before they get through the first week. But still, there is no shortage of eager applicants. Most agree that the first week is the toughest. It really has nothing to do with parachutes and planes. It's a lot of PT, physical training. In the second week, the airborne candidates strap on a parachute harness and learn the PLF, the parachute landing fall. So it goes from PT to PLF, PDQ. They need to absorb the training that we do give them. They need to be able to do things automatically. Your body needs to know how to react to certain things. Prepare to drag, drag. Students are drilled over and over again on how to exit an aircraft, how to steer their chute, and how to land. Good skills to master before plunging out of the sky and into battle. We're teaching people how to exit the aircraft and control their body from the time they exit the aircraft, to keep a good tight body position and to control their descent while they're descending. Uh, here you need courage, strength, and uh, training, discipline. Uh, if you don't have that, you're not going to make it to the airborne school. Go on, go on. Oh. Two shots. Two shots. One shot. One shot. Hook him up, hook him up, hook him up. Let's go. Three, two, one, zero. Stand by. Go. Keep walking. I just thought of another Jody for these guys. Training is an endless grind to build my body and my mind. Running and jumping all day long. One mistake and you are gone. Jumping out an aeroplane. Smack the ground and feel the pain. I don't care, some say it's nuts. I'm not walking, I'm no putz. Every paratrooper that jumps out of an airplane is counting his parachute to open. He is putting his life in the hands of the parachute riggers and parachute packers and hoping that they had a good day at work. There's no rooms for mistakes, no matter how small in this field, because these are life support systems. A person's life depends upon this. It could be yours, it could be mine, someone I don't even know. This is my job, to save lives. That's what a parachute rigger does. Packing 25 a day, 30 a day, whatever. That's 25 and 30 lives, human lives. It's not just material. It's the man and the woman behind it. You have to have specific scores on your arm surfaces vocational aptitude battery in order to be intelligent enough to be a parachute rigger. Because you have to be a logistician, a mathematician, and a comedian all at the same time part-time philosopher, just to keep sane. Now, it may look like we're manhandling this parachute, but in actuality, once you get that radial scene fall together to form the air channel, you can kick this parachute around, and the air channel's still going to be there. This chute will open. I'll jump it myself. I'll jump any chute I pack or any of my fellow riggers pack. Hey, Air Force gets you up, but we get you down on the ground safely. After countless practice PLFs, the students are ready for the real thing, 
During the final week, they'll board Air Force transport planes and make five jumps from an altitude of about 1,250 feet. This is the moment of truth, or maybe panic. I think the reality of the whole situation hits everyone at different times. Some people were starting to feel it walking on the aircraft. Walked out to the plane, we're all nervous and edgy. And we get in the plane, the plane takes off, and you relax a little bit more. And they first take off, they go 10 minutes, and that tell you to stand up and everything. Whoa, this is real. You're actually going to jump out of a plane. It's not natural to jump out of a plane. For me, it was when the door opened. You hear the wind. From one second to the next, it goes from a, from a roar to just absolute silence. When you leap out that aircraft and you got your form and you start counting, that wind snatches you and you're really surprised that you, you're moving and you end up going sideways before the chute opens. But it, it's still, a, when you feel a chute open, it's a good feeling. A fifth landing that you can walk away from means that jump school is finally over and you can collect your sanity at the door. When they come here, we instill discipline in them and esprit de corps and morality and try to revamp their way of thinking and their way of life so they can carry on from here into their outfits and show that out to everybody else. See, I'm airborne. See what I can do. Can you do the same? A pair of silver wings pinned to their chests separate these soldiers from all other warriors. All right, airborne, you're not a leg no more. You're paratroopers. Now, all that jumping out of airplanes, storming the beaches, and riding around in armored vehicles looks pretty exciting. Certainly, it looks hard, but it still looks fun. But there are other sides to the life of a foot soldier that are a little more routine, a little more mundane, like the food. In World War II, they called it C rations and K rations. Today, they are MREs, or meals ready to eat. However, depending on who you talk to, MRE might stand for meals rejected by everybody. Here's a group of fresh recruits at Fort Benning, Georgia, about to experience their first taste of MREs. first impression was that I've, I've enjoyed each one. And honestly, they're, they're very good. And I, I, I feel I'm a bit of a connoisseur of food. Well, I, actually, I thought it was going to be a little bit worse. I thought it was going to be cold and hard, because my father's in the army. So he told me about it. He was trying to scare me, really. But it, it's OK. The Army continues to improve the MRE and add new selections to the menu. Food, like everything else, is getting more high-tech. It's time to meet the foot soldier of the next century, the land warrior. Despite a world full of smart bombs and precision weapons, the Army still sees a need for the common foot soldier well into the next century but he will be far better equipped than his ancient ancestors. The soldier of the future will carry a computer on his back, a TV camera mounted on his rifle, night vision sensors, and a satellite uplink that will let his commander know his position at all times. The equipment is so versatile, it'll do just about everything except pull the trigger and write a letter home to mom. This soldier looks like an actor costumed for a science fiction movie. But this guy is not a fantasy. He's real. Well, almost real. He's the living prototype of the Army's next generation high tech foot soldier called the Land Warrior. Land Warrior is a uh, technology based integrated fighting system that will allow the infantrymen to win on the tough battlefields they expect to face in the future. Uh, to this end, we are looking to harness technology in the area of lethality, survivability, mobility, sustainability in our command and control to make sure that uh, 
our infantrymen of the future doesn't lose any fights and is able to dominate all of them. In other words, this guy is a killing machine. Two enemy, 12 o'clock. Drop packs, flank left. Land Warrior's gear is broken down into five basic subsystems. The helmet assembly, the protective clothing, the weapon, the computer, and finally, the stuff that runs the computer, the software. About the only off-the-shelf items you'll find in this man's ensemble are his uniform called a BDU, which stands for Battle Dress Utilities and his boots. The heart of the Land Warrior system is the computer and the radios which are integrated into the backpack frame. The backpack bends with the body and easily adjusts to the user's needs. All sorts of pockets put ammunition within easy reach. The sunglasses protect their eyes from enemy laser beams. The new helmet is lighter, yet stronger than the one it replaces. A special viewing display, basically a small TV screen, flips down in front of his eye. The weapon is a shortened M16 rifle modified with an accessory rail. Depending on the needs of the particular mission, the soldier can attach different optical components, like a thermal sight, night vision sight, a laser range finder, and even video camera. After all the different systems are connected, the Land Warrior energizes his computer and he is ready for combat. So the age-old command of lock and load has become lock and load and boot up. Land Warrior's sensors and computers are tied together by a remote input pointing device, something you and I might call a computer mouse. With a push of a button, he can select various views from his sensors or Army intelligence data files and even maps. When you look at it, the rifle isn't really all that different. The body armor isn't radically new. What is different is the unprecedented amount of information that the Land Warrior has at his fingertips. Uh, that's not to say there still won't be unknown. Sensors will still fail. There'll still be an imprecision that we can never hope to completely master in warfare. It will never be a, a perfect business by any stretch of the imagination. But we will significantly improve our ability to uh, to self-orient and make sure that our friends are our friends and understand where enemies act and act appropriately. Until recently, foot soldiers had what they called a worm's eye view of the war. They could see and deal with just what was right in front of their face. But the high-tech systems of the land warrior will give the soldier an awareness and a deadliness that he has never had before. Technology is not a substitute for a quality soldier. We know that the digital technology that's, uh, that we're harnessing now gives us the ability to make decisions faster and faster. But at the same time, that requires an intellect that is extremely quick. So the expectation is a soldier, when confronted with novel circumstances brought by these many sensors and into his eyepiece, will be able to do the right thing. With ongoing field tests, the Army hopes to fix any bugs that might pop up and start outfitting soldiers with the new gear by the year 2000. Land Warrior System has given unprecedented power to the infantrymen. It may look like it's one step closer to a time when robots might replace humans on the battlefield. But make no mistake, the grunt is here to stay. Until you change human nature, until you eliminate uh, the possibility of any group of people being so bloody-minded that they will fight to the death, 
you will need grunts. Because ultimately, if you want to defeat this force, you're going to have to do it on your own, uh, with your own people, uh, doing it by hand, as it were. Uh, we have not developed any technology now that will always enable you to just pick up a phone and say, will you surrender? And they will. Over the centuries, the weapons, the equipment, and the lifestyle of the infantryman has changed dramatically. And it looks like he's poised for another big change as he enters the digital age. But despite the new technology, the foot soldier of tomorrow will still have a lot in common with his ancient ancestors. Foot soldiers have always been resourceful and courageous and driven by a sense of honor and duty. And no matter where the future may take him, the foot soldier will always carry a piece of his ancient heritage.